Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 75 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today's show is all about injuries, how to deal with them, what to do with your downtime, and how to prevent injuries. And to talk about that, I have five people that I highly respect within the Jiu-Jitsu world and got their insights on injuries. And the guests include Ty Gay. Roy Dean, Hiron Gracie, Mark Kukro, and Henry Akins. And these guys have been around a while and have some great insights regarding the subject of injury. So this is not meant to be clinical information. These guys aren't doctors or healthcare professionals, but they are experienced jiu-jitsu instructors and practitioners. So we're going to get it from that insight. On a future show, I might have some healthcare professionals and get their take as well. Okay, after the interview, stick around for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. So we're going to go ahead and dive in. And first up is Ty Gay, who is the owner and head instructor at Redline Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in Edmond, Oklahoma. Okay, Ty, hello and welcome, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me, bro. My pleasure, sir. Always a pleasure. So we're talking about injuries. So have you had any significant injuries? And if so, tell us what those were and what you did to uh, recover or or deal with those, Ty. Oh, man. Yeah, you know, in the beginning of my career, there wasn't as much information that's out there about how to train. And I trained pretty rough, and I have several discs that are um, questionable in my back. Um, I believe I have six herniated discs, and that's from the top to the bottom, which um, at one point I was told here in Oklahoma by a doctor that I was going to have to quit doing jiu-jitsu, and I might think about seeking out a pain management doctor, all this crazy talk. And it was pretty bad. Um, I had a friend of mine through another friend that was a surgeon and he was in Australia at the time, but said he would do the surgery for me when he got back. So I talked to Hiron Gracie, my coach, and um, he really kind of turned me on to the idea of just a different path of jujitsu. Cause I was kind of facing like, I'm going to have to stop training like this, you know? And, And according to the doctors, I was just gonna have to quit, but through personal rehab and a different training methodology um, I was able to avoid surgery I live a pretty pain-free life to be honest I don't take any ibuprofen or anti-inflammatories anything uh, and have pretty good success now there are some days where my back becomes what I call inflamed it's like just more swollen up than normal and on those days I listen to my body big time mm-hmm. I don't want to go in there and train on it too much or do whatever so really the thing that changed everything for me was heat on kind of talking to me about a little bit about his grandfather and like how he wanted to be able to live that lifestyle, the jujitsu lifestyle forever. Because what happens to a lot of us is that we get into the tournament scene or whatever. And 
um, the lifespan there is just not that long, you know, and then uh, we get injured and then we can't train like we used to. So we quit or we just sit on the couch too long until we can't get back on the mat type of thing. So what I have done is I try to just to, to take out all the impact where I can. It's not that I don't roll hard because there are days when I'm roll, you know, we're going full bore. But there's also, in my mind, I'm always trying to practice the safest way possible. And then one day a week, and I got this from Heat On also, I come into the, my academy and pretend as if I'm 80. And all my moves have to work for an 80-year-old. You know, it's like, um, so I don't hit my knees real hard on the mat. I, you know, I obviously don't get a lot of submissions on that day because I, I assume that my hands aren't going to work that well as far as grips and stuff. But it allows me to still roll. I still get the benefits, you know, out of jiu-jitsu. And I want to prepare for that day. I want to be able to still be on the mat when I'm 80 years old. And we have guys at our gym, as you know, that are in their um, mid-70s, late-70s. And the only reason these guys can train with us is because we understand that it is a lifelong journey. And uh, so the younger guys are always watching out for the older guys. And there's kind of a cohesive relationship there that's beneficial for everybody. Now, don't get me wrong. We've got guys that do tournaments and that train, you know, I mean, you know, hardcore. We even mm -hmm. have a tournament class. But um, our ultimate goal is to be able to stay on the mats for the rest of our lives. And so that's what our focus is. Wow. I think that's what makes it okay for us to have injuries. Now, we're injured. I don't make people train or don't want them to train if they are injured. But I do like them to come to the academy, and we call it smelling the academy air. Wow. I believe that jiu-jitsu breaks down into three parts, which is um, physical, which gets all the, the glory, you know, arm locks and chokes. And then there's the mental, and then there's the verbal. So whenever you're hurt, it gives you a, an amazing opportunity to work on the two other pieces of jiu-jitsu, the mental and the verbal, you know. So that's really it. That's how my, how my lifestyle kind of works. Wow. That's great, man. That's great insight. I. What a great turnaround you spoke of with, you know, facing surgeries and everything and avoiding that and actually going from that to just thriving the way you do now. It sounds like it starts with the mindset and tempering, of course. you know, tempering your training, balancing your training with some hard but also some soft. I love what you said about the training like you're 80. I think that's really cool. And then um, what you said about working on the other two pieces during injury time. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, because if you think about it, if it really is just three pieces like that, then um, and we're always working on the physical aspect of it, it would be easy to, to neglect the mental and the verbal, you know? So, uh, like, I have a student of mine right now who's had a knee injury, and so he's just coming every day to the gym, and he's really working on the mental and the verbal. And the verbal is when you're using the mental aspect in real life, in real time, talking to people that aren't in jiu-jitsu, that are, you know, in your life. So it gives us an opportunity. So, And I get a lot of this stuff from Hedon because he's, you know, a big influence in my life. And I do credit him to a lot of that. I probably wouldn't be on the mat today if it wasn't for him kind of explaining how things could work. Wow. So giving props where props are due, but you certainly For take sure. take what you learn, though, and, and uh, drop the pebble in the water, so to speak, and spread it uh, throughout your own life. So props to you for that. Anything else uh, around injury prevention or rehab or anything like that? Well, the one thing I would say, and I'm not, I'm not knocking surgery because surgery is, is sometimes very necessary, but if you come to a jiu-jitsu guy and you ask him, hey, what should I do? He's going to say jiu-jitsu. So if I go to a spine surgeon, let's say, and I say, hey, look at my MRI, and what's he going to say? Right. The only thing that he's ever been taught to say. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. For some people, that's, it's, a, sure. you know, it's a good fix. But I would go as long as I possibly could without some sort of surgery because, I mean, the information's out there. You can just Google it. You don't have a very long lifespan of training or whatever after a major surgery like that. Now, knees and elbows and scoping is a little bit different, but... When it comes to like the spine, you know, it's, it's a little bit scary. So for me, I think it was best to wait. Mm. Well, I like what you said about the, I mean, surgery is an option for some people in some cases, and we're not anti whatever is available, but you're, right, you're right. totally on point with, um, if you're a surgeon, you see most problems as a surgical problem. I used to be a massage therapist for years and worked a lot with sports and a lot of injury. And um, I, I saw so many people that had got a consultation and in a lot of cases had surgery that, that actually didn't fix their problem. But right. always when they go for a surgical consultation, you know, they're going to get, hey, this is a surgical problem. Where a lot of times you can do a lot with, you know, muscle work, chiropractic, different things like that, stretches. That's right. But you, you always want to 
you know, be safe about it as well and, and check out all the options. So, The other thing that I, I, that I didn't really mention that is probably, well, I'd say, super important that gets overlooked the most is really the diet. Mm-hmm. Like if your diet is not really on point, you're going to have more injuries. You're going to not be as, you know, that's – and I think that everybody kind of knows that, but sometimes we just – turn a blind eye to it you know so i'd say with 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 all those components um that's what keeps you safest i I would say the mindset and everything but with also a very clean diet great great points great points well thank you sir i appreciate you contributing your insights and knowledge in this arena i'm sure people will uh benefit greatly from it so awesome thank you so much be well my friend thank you 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 too Bye. bye Okay, next up is Professor Roy Dean, BJJ Black Belt under Professor Roy Harris. Okay, Roy, hello, sir. Nice to be uh, talking with you again. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Marty. Yeah, my pleasure, as always. So I know you've had some some significant injuries in your uh, BJJ career. I know you you had a a pretty bad knee injury, uh, among other things. So if you would just tell us about uh, some of those, how they happened, and and what you did to kind of get through that or rehab from them. So I've definitely had my share of injuries um, over the years. I've had a couple of knee injuries that, while they didn't require surgery, um, they were definitely a blow both, you know, physically taking me off the mat and then emotionally there's an aftermath with, when dealing with the injury that's, that's also very tough to, uh, kind of tough to stomach. I was doing a demonstration once it was a, a blue belt demonstration. I hadn't warmed up enough. One of my students was testing for his blue belt. I hadn't warmed up enough. He was very warm, very athletic. I tried a knee cut calf. He held onto my foot with his knees and my, I just heard this pop. Oh, man. And, um, you know, and I, another time I was uh, sparring with somebody and um, they did kind of a crazy deep half sweep and my knee bent the wrong way, um, rotated outwards and popped twice. And those were both pretty difficult injuries. But, you know, Originally, when I was a younger martial artist, I felt like these injuries would last forever. But after you've gone through a number of injuries, you realize, okay, that's just a setback. It's not permanent. And you just allow yourself to rest. That that two-week period after the initial injury is really critical that you don't re-injure it. Mm. And you don't make it worse. You know, So for people that think they're you know, really tough and going to train through it, if you get a significant injury in your knee, but that is a window that you need to avoid. Take take some time off, and then um, you know essentially rehabilitation, strengthening. Not always te- uh, like testing the range of motion, but getting on that bicycle, strengthening the muscles around it, and um, and just taking it easy. And when you come back to the mat, don't be afraid to give up position uh, if it puts that injury in any kind of danger or strain. Good advice for sure. What do you say to the people that, I'm sure you've heard this before, you know, they're out for just a short time, but they're itching to get back on, so they say, well, I'm just going to go there, I'm not going to roll. And then when they get there and they're watching, oh, oh I'm just going to go drill, and, oh, then I'm just going to go light, and the next thing you know what, they're rolling again, and they're re-injuring it or, or aggravating it or whatnot. Yeah, I I think they're on the right track up to a point. Okay. So going and observing class, and watching, in Japanese they call it mitori keiko, which is, you know, watching is learning. Mm, nice. So being able to watch class, sit on the sidelines, there are some significant advantages that people don't. It's kind of like a, it's a little bit of a secret. You watch class, you get that third-person perspective on your teammates and your classmates, and you, you really get to see their game in a different light. You get to see their tendencies, and by the time you hit the mat, you have a just a more informed opinion of of how people do things on the mat. And sometimes you can end up in an advantage because you've been studying them. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, the discipline to go to class but not roll is tough because it's infectious. <laughs> the energy is infectious. You know, you're hanging out with your friend. Oh, let me just do the No, stay disciplined. Go to class. Watch. That's great. But then you got to call it, you know, 
don't don't get on the mat don't just just watch observe and then when you're ready to start training again do it in a progressive fashion you know just do the the drills work with really safe people that you trust um, preferably an upper belt if possible and you know and make your way back but observing and studying other people's tendencies while you're injured uh, that's one of the key uh, breakthroughs that you can have in your game. The second breakthrough that you can get through suffering an injury is that you have to adapt physically. Like, okay, that, you know, for example, Gordo invented the half guard after a knee injury. Uh, and there is, there's a way that you will adapt your movement and discover techniques uh, that you wouldn't ordinarily do. And so when you're coming back from an injury, and you're protecting it, um, you tend to assume different body positions uh, that, you know, safeguard it. And I think your game can really expand and you can increase your arsenal of techniques um, because you would never have gone to that position unless it was necessary. And there's nothing more critical and necessary than protecting an injury. Mm, That's good. So avoiding risky situations on your way back and being open-minded about new positions that maybe you weren't that keen on before. Exactly. Any um, advice for injury prevention, as well as speaking a little more about that emotional element to uh, having to rehab an injury? You know, a lot of injuries uh, take place when people don't, either they don't tap early enough, which you kind of get over that after the first four months. You kind of understand, okay, I'm in a bad position here. That pattern has repeated itself enough times, so you really understand that you can just tap and, and let it go. That's good. When it comes to preventing injuries, warming up is critical. You know, I suffered a groin injury uh, when I was a purple belt that kept me off the mat for about five months. Um, and even to this day, I still feel a difference in between my hips, um, because of that one injury. And I asked a, a a brown belt who had suffered a similar injury. I was like, what's the deal, man? How do I, how do I come back from this? He said, you know, give yourself plenty of rest because essentially you need your groin muscles at all times Mm -hmm. in jiu-jitsu, especially when playing guard. He said, warm up like an old man. I was in my 20s, but I started warming up like an old man. And that is so important. Now, you don't have to kill yourself, but you got to get the blood flowing. You have to get that range of motion in your joints, and you have to warm up that connective tissue. A lot of injuries happen when people jump into a situation. One person is really warm, Mm -hmm. and the other person is cold. And if the the person that's warm is a lower rank, than the person who's cold, uh, sometimes you're forced to move very, very quickly. And those are the moments that you can get injured. I remember one time, I think I was a brown belt or a purple belt, and there was a blue belt who was out to get me. Uh, I hadn't really warmed up that much, but he's, I think he started on my back, it was positional sparring, and he went for it. I mean, he really went for it. And I ended up escaping but I had to use the power of my hamstring to be able to escape this position. And I totally pulled my muscle and I was like, man, that was not worth it. I will not do that again. If somebody goes out of the gate at a hundred percent, I'll just give it up. You know, until you're warmed up, you should just give it away. Once you're warmed up, then you can be a little bit more competitive, but that cold versus hot Um, that people can really get into some trouble, um, defending the rank, defending their ego Mm -hmm. and, um, and sacrifice their body in the process. Wow. All right. Did you want to speak a little to the, uh, emotional component, uh, before we bring it to a close? I'd love to. It's, you know, your physical well-being plays a huge role in stimulating your brain, and your brain chemistry and what you're flooding your brain with. And then to become used to that kind of high performance mode that you're in where, you know, you're active, you're flexible, you're sharp, you're socially engaged to have all of that come to a crashing halt and then to be essentially in pain all of the time. 
um, protecting that injury, thinking about how your plans for world domination on the jiu-jitsu stage have now been waylaid <laughs> because of this injury. And you start going through all of this, oh, all these people are getting better. I'm getting farther and farther behind. You know, all of these things can weigh on you. And a lot of high-end athletes suffer from depression when, if they get a serious injury. So you need to understand that that's perfectly natural to get a little bit down, to be a little bit depressed, and to, one, be on guard for it, to, two, understand that you can do things. Uh, you're not going to be able to recreate the high that you get from jiu-jitsu, but you can still go to the gym and work the parts that uh, aren't injured. And three, it's even more important to go connect with the people at the academy because you don't want that, even if you can't get that physical high, you can still get the community and social bonding. And that will really help carry you through that difficult period uh, that a lot of athletes experience if they get injured. Yeah, great stuff. Really great insight, man. Really appreciate you, uh, your contribution to this and uh, you sharing your insight and wisdom. Thank you so much, sir. Oh, my pleasure, Marty. Talk soon. Okay, moving on now to Hiron Gracie of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy in Torrance, California. Okay, Hiron, nice talking to you again, sir. Good talking to you also, Marty. All right. So we're talking about injuries, and I know you've had uh, at least one or, or a few significant injuries in your lifetime. So if you would share what that was, and kind of how you got through that, that time and that, uh, that period. Yes. So, um, I've always, I've always had little neck pains. Uh, maybe it has to do with my height. Maybe it has to do with all the guard work, who knows, people breaking my posture. And about, I want to say four years ago, I went and got got it checked out. And I think it was, C5, C6, maybe, is it C5 or C4? I'm not sure. But basically, I had a bulging disc, and pain was like shooting down my left arm for probably two months, maybe a month and a half, two months. And I have, you know, friends of mine that have different treatment centers that can help with things like this. And I, I tried it all, and everything helped a little bit. Uh, but fortunately, I had one friend of mine who's actually into therapy and he gave me some exercises to do on my own. And thanks to his help, I, I think within 24 hours, I went from like a numb hand, numb thumb and fingers to zero pain and zero numbness. Like it was out of this world, wow. what my friend Ezekiel did for me. And it's, it's so good that I have actually referred him to a few people and I have shown the exercises that he's taught me to a few people and I've had people say, Hey, don't, uh, I no longer have neck pain. My pain is now gone. My back feels better than ever. So it's a different level. And I actually talked to him last weekend. We were together. He said, let's do some videos together, him and I, and Hannah, hopefully to just kind of spread the message and share his concepts. They're not his concepts. You obviously learned them from somebody but to share the concepts that he taught me to the world. So hopefully that'll be out there soon. Awesome. So the first thing is to seek out something, someone can help you. And this may mean more medical treatment, or it may mean just good therapy, some good muscle work, that kind of thing. It sounds like what, uh, what are your thoughts about when you're out with an injury, you're off the mat, you can't train. Uh, what are some good ways to look at that? And what are some things you can do with that downtime? Like for me right now, like when I'm, let's say I hurt my finger or my elbow, it's right off a little injured actually. Um, I, I very much enjoy being injured because it allows me to sit out and observe and relax. And oftentimes we feel like if our body feels good, we feel pressure to have to roll mm -hmm. and spar. But there is value in, you know, watching the group spar. So being on the mat, but not, having to drill the techniques or spar, I think it has a lot of, lots of value. And, you know, Eddie Racy was proof of that. Okay. Eddie Racy watched Carlos for years. He watched him teaching uh, and he, he learned so much from watching. So we can do the same. Uh, and also, you know, the thing is, 
jujitsu, it is about learning techniques and detecting techniques, but it's also about just the environment and being around the people mm -hmm. that, that you meet on the mat. So you might be injured, but go hang out with your friends, go have some conversations and there's still growth to happen, even though you can't roll. Yeah, I, I completely agree. A great, great example you shared with your grandfather, Grandmaster Elio. I mean, if he, he certainly showed how much you can uh, can do and absorb just by watching. And I think it's also important what you said about you know being in the environment. Uh, for some people, and this worst thing you could do is you have an injury and use that for an excuse not to go to class, not to be around that atmosphere and that positive vibe. And that's the uh, beginning of the end, so to speak, for a lot of people. They start taking time off the mat and, and never find their way back. So that's important. Yes. So here on what about injury prevention? What thoughts do you have around uh, just avoiding injuries in the first place? I think that um, they, they talk about like lifting weights, for example. The, the more I learn, lifting weights is about creating body armor for yourself. And I'm not in the lifting weights phase right now. But I will soon move into that phase once my life allows. And I don't want to lift weights to lift a lot of weight. But you want to lift weight because you want to have muscle and muscle protects you. So, you know, having muscle, having flexibility and mobility, obviously if you're stiff, you're likely to hurt yourself. So things like that, those are basic things that anybody can do. The problem is that when you start getting stronger and then your jiu-jitsu, your strength starts to you know, possibly help your jiu-jitsu, you keep wanting to get stronger and stronger and stronger, and then you actually lose touch with what jiu-jitsu really is. So once again, it isn't about strength, it's about armor. It's about strength in terms of preventing injury. Uh, but I think the most important thing when it comes to injury prevention is the way that we approach our journey and our training. And we have to think about what did the, you know, the founding fathers, what did Carlos Gracie and Eddie Gracie want for us when it comes to jiu-jitsu? What did they expect from us? They expected us to learn, you know, effective, practical techniques, efficient techniques. They wanted us to learn how to defend ourselves. They wanted us to live better lives, right? Just apply jiu-jitsu to everything and live well. And our instructors today at your school, they also want the same thing. They want you to be ready for whatever life may throw in your way, your direction. They want you to have fun. But sometimes we allow our instructor's expectations. Like, for example, our instructor wants us to pack that person's guard and sweep that person, arm lock them, your training partner. And oftentimes, if, if you're too much in the pursuit of sweeping somebody and arm locking somebody and beating somebody, while also avoiding defeat, it, it puts you in this position where it's almost like you can't make a mistake and you have to do well. And I, I do agree that we do want to try to submit our partners and we do want to avoid defeat, but not at the cost of hurting ourselves. And oftentimes our intensity, how we, how we roll, we end up hurting ourselves because we try so hard to win or not to lose that, that something slips, something gives. Where in fact, like, when I roll right now more recently, I'm not too concerned with submitting anybody. I'm more concerned with not being submitted. But even that, if someone gets near a submission, it's okay. I'm almost, I'm happier to let them tap me than to, you know, twist and turn and bridge and panic to avoid the submission. And that's because I don't expect myself to never be submitted. I'm okay. I, I, I feel safe enough. Let's put it that way. I feel safe enough to be submitted. When if there's expectations that are, you know, I guess hovering overhead, expectations of not losing, it makes sense that you would do something very sporadic to avoid an, a submission and therefore it could possibly result in an injury, especially when you're going against somebody who's bigger and heavier, somebody who's more experienced, one day it will be somebody younger. So, it, you know, you're better off losing and staying safe than not being submitted and then getting hurt. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and just the, the, what is the mindset? When you step on the mat, most people are, okay, how am I going to beat this person? And I think even though that's a part of jujitsu, that's not the essence of it. The essence is you step on the mat, okay, 
let me stand by and figure out what this person wants. And when they show me something, my job is to neutralize it. And with that kind of attitude, you know, you're, you're asking very little of yourself compared to the person who has to avoid defeat and defeat their opponent. And by, by approaching it like that, I think that you're more likely to, um, you're going to avoid injury in more cases than not. Mm. So that mindset is absolutely important and crucial to avoiding injury. Do you think it's more difficult for someone new, say a white belt early on into jiu-jitsu or someone that's been around for a long time to adopt that mindset? Because on one hand, a white belt may be like, you know, hey, I don't want to look like I don't know anything. I'm new. I want to prove myself. And you know, yeah. a lot of times they spaz out. But then conversely, sometimes someone who has rank and maybe a lot of rank may you know, let the ego creep in and not want to be tapped by someone lower belt. So they may start guarding that, you know, and, and, and not be defeated kind of mentality. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good point. You're right. The, the more experienced person uh, they have to kind of uphold their reputation of being that, that brown belt, especially when rolling with a lower belt. Mm-hmm. They can't be a brown belt, you know, stuck under a blue belt. They have to escape. So I think there is something there. And so I don't think it has to do anything with belts or experience, although I do feel like people that are more experienced are more likely to be more relaxed when they approach the role and a little bit more uh, free-spirited and a little carefree and just in there to enjoy it because they've been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. So they have to have some idea as to how to protect themselves uh, against, you know, very crazy, sporadic, young, explosive, strong people. And, you know, and there are even beginners you know, very brand new blue belts that when you speak to them and you explain this to them, they say, you know what? This makes sense. It makes sense. I'm 41 years old and I, I'm, you know, very thick and I did a lot of, you know, amazing things in my life in, in terms of uh, physical feats and I have amazing motor skills. But the truth is at 41 years old, I have to have a plan. I have to protect myself. If not, this art that I enjoy so much could, could very quickly you know, slip out of my fingers and, and out of my life. So I see people that have very little experience learn to modify their expectation and they come in expecting very little and they take a lot home versus mm-hmm. expecting a lot and, you know, and failing multiple times. Because, you know, you know how it is. If you expect yourself not to be tapped out, not to be swept, not to be controlled, not to not be able to pass someone's guard. If you expect all these things, it's unrealistic mm-hmm. because if we know, if those of us that have been training forever know one thing, you're going to get swept for the rest of your life. You're going to get choked for the rest of your life. You're going to get arm locked forever. You're going to be stuck under somebody. There's always going to be somebody who can hold you down. These things will always happen. So you have to learn to embrace this sooner than later. Yes. And, 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 basically, and kind of almost submit to the journey. It's a long journey. It's challenging, but at the same time, it has to be safe. It has to be fun. It has to be practical. So the journey is a long one. And the sooner it is that you allow, you kind of, you, you surrender to what's going to happen to you over the next two, five, 10, 20 years, the more likely, you know, you'll be on the mat that long. I love what you said about the expectations because we can all get caught up in, you know, the old saying about the more expectations you have, the more potential for disappointment. And I think ego and expectations are very closely tied together and related. So, but it's never too young, uh, age wise or, or never too early rather age wise or into your journey in jujitsu to learn these thoughts and principles and, and this kind of philosophy. So I know you've been really active in spreading this kind of philosophy throughout the uh, jujitsu community in the world. And it's one of your missions to, to spread this mindset. So, Yes, my, I feel like everybody wants to train for the rest of their lives. Everybody sees the benefits of jiu-jitsu and being around and being on the mat and for so many reasons, but it's so hard to quit. Um, and it's because we don't have a plan. And you know how it is. Like when it comes to how you approach your rolling, you might approach it a certain way when you're 19. But when you're 27, it might change. It should change. And when you're 37, it changes again. When you're 47, it changes again. And maybe even every five years. So... You have to always modify your expectations. And if you don't do that, then you're going to very quickly find out that 
you know, you can't do all the things that you want to do. And you're not going to be ready for that. You have to be ready for that moment when you realize, you know what, I can't do this. Okay, great. You can't do that, but what can you do? Let's focus on what you can do. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Well, it's always a pleasure to, to talk with you here on. I could literally talk for hours with you, but we're going to keep it short on this one. And uh, I really appreciate your knowledge and insight and, and you contributing to this, uh, this important subject. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I appreciate it. And, you know, everybody should ask themselves one question, you know, who, who's, who's somebody that you know that practiced jujitsu into their 90s? And I don't think anybody knows anybody. Right? There might be very, there are very few people like that. That, that people not, the listeners out there today know, but we know Eddie Gracie, and he practiced into his nineties, and he did that because of he was able to do that because of what he expected of himself. And he always said one thing: he said, "If whoever doesn't lose can only win." So he walked in there with a the mindset every day of just not being defeated, and he won. And he won in more ways than one. He beat those opponents because they beat themselves, but he enjoyed jiu-jitsu his whole life. So that's a huge victory right there. Beautiful, beautiful. We always need to keep that in mind and, and keep that in sight. What a great example. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, sir. Take care. Thank you, Marty. Okay, moving on now to Professor Mark Kukro, who's a Pedro Sauer black belt and owner of Integrated Martial Arts in Harrisburg, North Carolina. Okay, I'm joined now by Mark Kukro. So welcome, Mark. Thanks for having me. Always my pleasure, my friend. Mark, uh, well, we're talking about injuries. So what injuries have you had in your jiu-jitsu journey, and how did you get through them? And did it involve any specific type of rehab? And how did you handle the downtime that comes with injuries? Okay, I think, um, you know, the biggest challenge for any injury, honestly, is mentally. And, um you know, kind of how to deal with your frustration and how can you still get training? And I think it's pretty common. Most people, you know, sprain toes and fingers occasionally, but probably the two injuries that um, caused me the most challenge was a sprained L- uh, MCL. And um, really it just, you know, we were training and it wasn't like anybody put on a submission, but we were just flowing and, uh, the person actually slipped and fell and kind of landed on my leg and it put a lot of quick pressure on my knee. And so, you know, I immediately knew something was wrong and, um, I thought it would just be sore for a couple of days. And then uh, I went to an orthopedic and had an MRI and of course it was a sprained, uh, MCL. And so, you know, basically I had a kind of a choice, like, am I going to tell myself that I can't train and I shouldn't train And I should really take it easy and take the time off. And the answer is yes and no, right? So um, I have to be very careful with what I do. And I also have to know my own kind of mental tendencies. So uh, basically, I went to the academy and I would, I could still teach. And I would take um, a lot, I would observe more basically. And then I would train around it. So it can really be as simple as, you just can't use your legs at all. And I can work on grips and breaking grips and I can just work around it, but you have to understand yourself well enough too to know that if you are, if you're a person that's capable of working around an injury and then when it starts to feel a little, little bit better, you have to be careful and make sure that you don't overexert yourself again because you feel better and then uh, re injure it or make it worse. But for any student that has any kind of injury, and I find most often the injuries are outside of the academy. It's usually doing something at home. And, um, you know, injuries should be a rarity, not a common occurrence. And um, that the, the, the student doesn't know, or sometimes they just don't think. Like, you know, I never thought about just coming in and taking really good notes and watching the positions and trying to notice details that I ne- I've never noticed before. So I would definitely start with that and just know your own tendencies. Like if you know that if you wear a gi and you can't train safely, then just go in regular clothes and take really good notes and make observations and ask questions and uh, go through your own notebook if you keep one. I think that's a really good way to still supplement your training. 
I agree. You said a, a number of really important things that I, I just want to comment on. You the the limitations in training. I really like that. You know, a lot of people talk about it being a good and positive thing to uh, go to the academy. You know, when even when you can't train, because you know you get that atmosphere. You get that. Mm-hmm. The, you know, the whole atmosphere creates that camaraderie. You're still in the mental game, so to speak, and it just uh, and it keeps you on that positive path, so you don't fall away. But also, for a lot of people, I think. You said something about knowing yourself. And for a lot of Mm -hmm. people, it's a really hard thing to limit their training. Like, okay, I'm just going to go watch. And then next thing you know, they're, I'm just going to do a little bit, you know, just drill. And next thing you know, they're rolling. So I think that has to to be taken into consideration. But if you can do that, if you're the kind of person that can really kind of temper yourself, I think a lot can be achieved through limiting your training, like only using your legs or if you have a hurt shoulder or arm, you know, putting that into your belt and not using it. I've, I've heard of a lot of really good gains being made by that kind of training. Sure. And uh, I, I 100% agree that if you know yourself and you know that you can still do some type of training, you should absolutely do it and keep that habit in your lifestyle. Because I find that if you take too much time off, sometimes the habits will start to creep into your uh, attendance and your performance and your expectations and your frustration. And so um, I highly recommend going, even if it's just to be up there. But also find a person that you can really trust to train with. You know, if you know someone is like they're just going to go a little too hard or they say that they're going to be careful, but you know that they, you feel like they might not be, then just be very careful with that and um, make sure that you have really good training partners. And, um, the second, let's see, what was the second injury? I had a rotator cuff injury, and it actually happened, the first time was when I was a child. I hit a curb and flew off a bicycle, and it tore my rotator cuff, and I fractured my arm. And um, so it's always been a little stiff, and uh, I don't even know what I was doing. I was at a seminar, actually, and um, someone asked to demonstrate a technique, and they called me up, and I said, yeah, sure, okay. And... Um, when I tapped, the person actually didn't let go. Hmm. And then I felt my, my rotator cuff pop. And I thought to myself, you know, you're using me as an Uki, as someone to, to, to demonstrate on. And when I tap, I, in my mind, I'm like, you should let go. And the person didn't let go. And it's in front of a group full of people. And uh, so, I, I'm, you know, I winced. And I just kind of I kept quiet at the moment. And then uh, I just kind of moved to the back of the room, and I knew my shoulder was injured. Oh, and, um, I mean, you know, of all places, <clears throat> I trust someone to come in and do a seminar, and that's what happened. But um, So that injury, that was a long time ago, but it took me a year of rehab wow. to get my shoulder to where I feel like it's 100%. And I had to get cortisone shots and, you know, go through the rehabilitation process. But I would like to kind of touch on the culture of the academy. It, the, um, the injuries, you know, there's going to be injuries in every kind of sport, no matter what it is, football, volleyball, basketball, soccer, you name it. But um, jiu-jitsu, it tends to be mostly fingers and toes. People just tape them up, and that's kind of normal. But a good way to avoid it is really try not to put open fingers on the mat. You know, if your hands are cupped or curled halfway or you put a fist on the floor – that will that helps a lot actually and then you know just kind of start with that but the training regimen itself like if if injuries are a common thing the training methodology to me needs to be improved corrected and adjusted mm-hmm. if it's a rare occasion it you know it's like it happens once every few years or every so often you know that's a little bit more in line what i think um an academy that has good training programs will be and now, if you're competing and you have training camps and you have to really, you know, get up and go and really get to it, you know, the likelihood might be a little higher, like a fight camp, basically. Right. But um, as a general rule, injury should be a rare occurrence. Yeah, I completely agree with that. You know, like you said, some of them are going to occur. If you're doing a physical activity uh, training, you know, they're going to occur occasionally. But if it's happening often, yeah. you need to really look at it. I think it's really important. And I'm glad you brought that up. I think the culture of the academy is huge, and it should be uh, an atmosphere of safety first. 
And, uh, right. and, and like you said, if you're, if you're pushing it to the higher level of competition, you know, you certainly may have to go a lot harder, but for the average person in the average class, uh, safety first. And, and you also talked about you know, training partners you can trust, you know, getting to know the ones that, you know, you can feel safe with is very important. And so those are great points. You touched right. on um, a little bit on, on prevention by talking about the, keeping the fingers off the mat. Uh, any other thoughts on preventing injuries? Well, you know, when, especially when students are new, and this is, you know, to me, this is what really grows a program is when people come in and they're a white belt first 10, 15, 20 classes, I don't think they should be rolling. I mean, like I'm strongly against someone brand new coming in. They don't even know how to tap and here they are rolling. They don't even know the name of a submission and yet they're getting submitted. So they just, they just yell and you'll hear someone and then they're injured. So I think in the beginning, you know, teaching some of the basic fundamental moves, this is what a choke feels like. This is when you tap. Don't tap the mat, tap the person. And you have kind of these rules in place. And then uh, after 10, 15, 20 classes, some places do it a little longer, you know, then you can introduce the person into like isolated sparring where it's just get out of side control, Mm -hmm. just get out of the mount, just pass the guard. Um, Try not to get taken down. And then you can start to add more flow to it. And then they ha- they have made the fundamental movements part of their muscle memory. So they're not making a grave mistake thinking that is that's something that they should do. And um, especially with kids, I have found that that is a huge um, deterrent and prevention for injuries. Like some of the kids sit with their legs in a W on the mat instead of with their feet crossed or in Anza or Seiza kneeling. And if someone just falls on them, their their knees and their and you know hips can get you know severely injured. Or if people lean back on one hand on the mat and someone is rolling behind them, you know they roll into the and there goes their elbow, wrist, or shoulder. So um, just little things like that, you know, and having really good attention to managing the mat when people are sparring. I don't think everybody should be sparring without one person supervising. There should always be somebody supervising the the mat the role and managing the distance between everybody yeah that's really great i really like that it's so mm-hmm. it's smart it just makes a lot of sense um instead of just kind of chaos if you have someone looking out for everybody and that's their purpose their job um things are going to turn yeah. out a lot better and and i like what you said about just being really aware uh, aware of your body and posture and body mechanics while you're on the mat even if you're just sitting the way you're sitting and, and things like that can make a lot of difference in preventing injuries Good. Just, you know, little things like when kids classes, especially kids, adults still, but not as much because we're bigger. Nobody can run across the middle of the mat when people are rolling. So they have to hit the perimeter of the mat and then go all the way around everybody instead of through them. And uh, it's very difficult to get rolled into if you're on the perimeter of the mat. But if you're in the middle of it, you just can't see everybody from every direction at the same time. Occasionally, something somebody will get rolled onto. So true. So true. Mm-hmm. All right, Mark. Well, thank you for uh, sharing your insights uh, and your knowledge. Uh, anything else that comes to mind um, related to injuries? Yeah, no, I think, you know, the big thing is just don't it, – it's easy to get discouraged. But if you do have an injury, be encouraged that you can work around it and find something to do that's beneficial to your jujitsu, your lifestyle, your health. There's always a way to work around it. And uh, you can benefit your training and you may develop an attribute that you never would have developed had you not had that injury. So, you know, look for the silver lining Mm. and uh, just be safe and train. Great advice. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Have a wonderful day. Okay, our last interview is with Professor Henry Aikens, who is a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu black belt under Master Hickson Gracie. I'm joined now by Henry Aikens. So welcome, Henry, and thank you so much for being part of this uh, injury discussion. Hey, thank you so much for having me on, Marty. Uh, always a pleasure to, to speak with you. So in your experience, Henry, what are the most common injuries in jiu-jitsu, and what injuries have you personally sustained during your jiu-jitsu practice uh, or journey? Common injuries in jiu-jitsu, I would say everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and, and just because, I mean, you know, we're, it's an art where we're constantly attacking the joints 
And so when you're attacking the joints and people aren't careful or the intensity levels sometimes is too high or, you know, mistakes happen. So, I mean, you're going for arm bar. So I know, you know, shoulders, uh, lower back is a big one. I know a lot of people have lower back just because of guard playing and, and, and you know, people stack passing and stuff like that or going for triangles and going for arm bars and getting stacked. Um, I think knees are a big one. Um, you know, necks, people's necks get jacked all the time. I, I see from, you know, guillotines or people grabbing other people's necks. So, I mean, I would just, <laughs> I don't know if there's one that's more uh, predominant than the other. Right. But um, I think one of the ones that takes a lot of people out of it is, is definitely with the back injuries. You know, back pain is probably mm. some of the worst pain that I think most people can deal with. So um, I think that's a, that's a big one. But, you know, what I see is uh, every... Everything gets injured. Fingers a lot, right, from gripping so much. People mm -hmm. always get their fingers tweaked and stuff like that. Toes, people get toes stuck in the mat and toes caught. So, What about you personally? Have you sustained any significant injuries? You know what? Um, I've been really quite fortunate in, in my career. Um, I blew out both my ACLs when I was a purple belt. Wow. Um, and it took me a year to rehab them. I never had the surgery on my knees. I, I was able to rehab my knees. Um, at, at the time, I was basically forced to because I didn't have any money and I didn't have insurance. Um, and so that was the one kind of pretty significant injury that I had. Um, I had a lower back injury, but it wasn't the, when the incident happened, I wasn't even doing jujitsu. I was just doing sprints upstairs and someone was coming down the stairs and I kind of hopped at a, at a weird angle and I kind of threw my body weight was kind of off and my posture was kind of off. And so, um, I ended up injuring my lower back and I was out of commission for quite a few months with that. Um, you know, I had some like a herniated disc and some impingement on the nerve. And so, uh, but speaking to doctors, what I, what, you know, I gathered from it, it was it was probably a lot of trauma, like micro trauma over time, and that was the incident mm -hmm. that just kind of was the you know the uh, the needle that broke the haystack right. or whatever. Right. Or um, yeah, I don't know really what the term is, but the, basically I think it's it the, the straw that broke. Back, yeah, whatever, straw that broke. Straw broke the like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm getting my terms mixed up, but uh, <laughs> you know, I had lower back pain, um, and then just the past couple of years, I had some some shoulder issues. So, yeah, it's been uh, interesting learning how to heal the body and, and deal with all that. Mm. You, know, you said something interesting with, you know, jiu-jitsu. You, you, there's no one particular injury. There's, you know, potentially a lot of different things that could uh, could happen to you. But you said about your injury off the mat, and uh, Mark Kukro was also speaking to this. And I hadn't really thought about that since I, the theme of the show was, you know, injuries in jiu-jitsu. So I was mainly thinking, you know, injuries that happen on the mat. But Injuries happen off the mat as well, which still affects your jiu-jitsu on the mat. So uh, it's good to keep that in mind that when we're talking about injuries, you know, it may be on the mat, it may be from doing something else, but it still affects your jiu-jitsu life and your practice. So, what Well, what's crazy is I've been doing jiu-jitsu for 22 years and almost on a daily basis, you know, involved in jiu-jitsu some way. If I'm not teaching a group class, I'm teaching a private lesson, or I'm doing – and – the the injuries that I sustained, um, I, I had one in competition when I was a purple belt where I blew up with my ACLs. Um, and like I said, it took me a year to recover. But my back and my shoulders, my shoulders actually, I jacked both my shoulders up from sleeping. Weird. Wow. But again, I figured, I, you know, what I've learned is it was poor posture and basically from overusing certain muscle groups, which happens in jiu-jitsu all the time. We, we're, it's like repetitive movements and repetitive posture. And, yes. you know, our shoulders, we always have forward rotation of the shoulders, mm -hmm. which throws off. And so, um, yeah, I woke up one day and I usually sleep with my arm underneath my head and my arm over, you know, lifted up. And uh, I just woke up one day and I just had so much pain in my shoulder and it was been one shoulder after the other. So I realized it took me a long time to figure it out, but I was like, oh, my posture is really bad, yeah. you know, and it, it comes from, you know, always being forwardly rotated with the shoulder. So the last year and a half, it's been a lot of work trying to realign my posture. Yeah, you know, Rob Wolf spoke to that as well uh, when he was on the show, that we're always in a state of flexion, you know, so often in jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. whether it's you being in the guard and your hips are flexed or, like you said, your shoulders are kind of rounded. And you do that a lot enough, and it really uh, is accumulative. So what did you do to to deal with your injuries and, and your time off the mat? 
mean, for for me, you know, I don't have much time off the mat. So that's the thing. I, I kind of learned to work around my injuries because I'm still teaching. So even though I'm not training, I'm still quite involved in jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I'm injured, a lot of times I just kind of try to work around and st- I'm still able to kind of be on the mat and teaching. Um, but a big part of it is obviously the physical therapy. You know, tons of physical therapy, trying to correct the imbalances that build up over time in the body from doing jiu-jitsu. You know, which I found out, like, even though people think, like, oh, we're using every muscle group and we're constantly using the body and you're you're doing all these wide angles of motions, all these, um, you know, a, a really wide array of different angles and motions, we still develop imbalances in the body over years and years of doing jiu-jitsu. And so if we don't actively work to correct those imbalances, what happens is injuries start to happen. Mm. So the state of our physical being and those imbalances in our in our musculature and our posture sets us up for injuries oh for sure yeah uh any advice on i know you can't really stay off the mat uh because you're teaching even if you're injured but for the average student uh what would you tell them when they sustain an injury would you tell them to keep coming or just take some time off or work well, around yeah that's a big thing like you know you people think that you actually need to train to get better which is not true Yes, obviously that's one of the ways to improve the best and, and the quickest is to, to, you know, get on the mats and train. But there's so much training that can be done. I mean, just in your mind, um, you know, now nowadays, you know, there's so much jujitsu that's available to watch online. You know, there's, um, for me, back in the day when I was injured, when I was training at Hickson's, we didn't have all this online content available. So I was still going to class every day. Even though I was injured, I was still going to class and what's amazing about watching classes sometimes you gain more out of watching the class than actually participating in the class yourself because what I noticed is when you're when you break up into pairs and you're working as a pair and you're trying to figure out a technique or you're trying to apply the technique what happens is the instructor kind of walks around and gives out pointers to all the different groups, whether they're doing it right or they're doing it wrong, or he gives a little details. And so by being an outside participant and kind of watching the class and seeing what the instructor, all the little pointers and tips the instructor was giving um, to the groups, you, you know, you, you get so much more detail out of the technique. And so, yeah, just by me watching, and even watching other people's training, you know, watching sparring, um, I would see what people were doing to other people to either counter moves or to be able to get moves. And so, that, you know, for me, that was always a huge tool. Like, even if I wasn't able to train, I was always watching class. I was watching training. It was always, jujitsu was always on my mind, you know? Absolutely. And that's, that's been kind of a central theme with uh, everybody I've talked to about this is, is don't stop coming to class. You know, first of all, it'll, it'll break your momentum. And some people will end up falling away from jujitsu. But, uh-huh. you know, just absorbing that atmosphere, the energy, the camaraderie, but also, like you just said, just watching and absorbing those details from a kind of a third person perspective uh, can be very very beneficial also you talked about the videos Uh, and in this day and age there's so much uh, online you know one can benefit from as well as visualization you know watching the video you can absorb a lot but also using that mental training i know you're familiar with the the studies on like basketball free thrower yep yeah basketball players doing free throws where visualization uh, yeah they have that, that group that didn't train at all the other group did actual free throws in the third group, just visualized it themselves going mm-hmm. through it perfectly. And at the end, they were pretty close to the same for the, for the latter right. two groups. So power of the mind is incredible. Yeah. Well, and if you think about it, it, learning, just learning in general, I mean, think about high-level basketball teams, high-level football teams. What do they do? You know, well, there's, there's days where they just watch tape on whatever team they're playing against. Very true. Why do they watch tape? So they're just watching videos so that they can learn to see what the, this other team is doing and they can figure out how to counter them or how to beat them or learn their plays or learn, you know, what they're doing. And so, you know, you see that also in, in at the highest level in every other sport. People are constantly watching video on their opponents, watching video on other teams to see what are they doing, how are they achieving success. Coaches are all the time watching videos on other teams and what they're doing that's creating success. You know, and so we can, we can do this too. It's it's such an amazing time um, right now for jiu-jitsu because so much content is uh, is available online for us to view. You know, not only the um, online instructionals, but you have things like flow grappling, which is now televising. You know, 
all of these jiu-jitsu matches. So you can watch these competitors at any time, you know, competing at high, very high-level matches and seeing what they're doing to counter each other, what they're doing to be able to finish each other. Very true. It's a great, powerful tool, and we should all be using that for sure. So you touched on uh, preventing injuries, uh, Henry, and you talked about the state of your body and musculature and posture imbalances, things like that. Anything else come to mind when you're talking about preventing injuries from happening? Preventing injuries from happening. You know, the big thing for me now, uh, I'm 42 years old, um, is is really just maintaining my body. What I've, what I've found is that um, helping the body to recover. So when you're younger, your body recovers much faster. Um, and so it's basically kind of a passive recovery. You just go home, rest, or you take a day off, and then you recover. But as you get older, I think the body needs a little bit more help. And what you have to do is more active recovery. And so, like, you know, doing cold plunges, cold, uh, you know, getting massage, you know, getting like neuromuscular work like we, we talked about earlier. Um, so I think all those things are extremely beneficial. Foam rolling, you know, um, doing the strength and conditioning to make sure that your joints and your everything stay strong and mobile. So I think all of those things really, really help with preventing injury. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think all those things are, are really great to, to implement and especially for anybody. But like you said, as you're getting a little older, and I'm certainly in that boat, uh, I find that making sure I warm up super thoroughly and then definitely doing things like massage and active ways to, to recoup. And then training methodology also has a huge impact, you know, how people train. Mm, I think true. people people don't realize that you can you can still improve in jiu-jitsu without training and going like 100 percent every day um you know conor McGregor, i think it was either conor mcgregor or his coach john Kavanaugh said you know when we train we're trying to upgrade the software so you know you can still improve in skill and timing and movement without having to beat your body up you know, and that's one of the things like, you know, with that camp with Connor here, he says he always shows up to fight. Well, why? Because he, even though he's training intensely, he's not training and injuring himself. So the training that he does is a very, very smart style of training where he's developing his timing. He's developing the skills without getting beat up, you know, where you see like other, you know, other gyms or other camps, you see, you know, fighters are always injured because, you know, when they train, they're going, they're constantly going at 100%, and that just creates an environment for injury. Anytime you're, the intensity level increases, the the risk of injury also increases. Mm, very important idea there, for sure. We should all keep that in mind. I love the phrase, um, up, upgrading the software. That's a really cool thing to keep in mind when you're doing your training and keeping it very technical. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. Is like, I think, I think, you know, especially as you as you get older, because your body's not recovering, like one or two hard trainings a week, and the the rest of the training is very smooth and technical, and really more developing technique and skill set. Yes, totally agree with that for sure. Well, I could talk to you all day about this uh, for sure. Uh, your wealth of knowledge, but uh, any last thoughts on injuries at all? The subject of injuries. Um, injuries suck. <laughs> That's my, my uh, I would last agree with thought that. on it. You I know, I mean, the, the, you know, the main way for us to improve in, in anything is consistency. And, you know, injuries always suck for people. They, they, you know, people think that they, it takes us time off the map, but there's also a lot of learning to be had when you're injured, you know, and developing new ways of training, um, learning how to work around injuries too. A lot of times people feel like, oh, if I'm injured, I have to stay off the mat. So I remember I had an injury on my shoulder. And um, so I was training still, but I was just tying my hand in my belt. So I wasn't using my shoulder. That actually helped to develop my game a lot. Yeah, I've heard a lot about that kind of training. And, and, and if you can, if you're the kind of person that can temper yourself and, and keep it, you know, focused, that can go a long way in developing other uh, aspects of your jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Well, man, I want to thank you so much. Uh, you're, like I said, you're a wealth of knowledge, and it's always a pleasure to talk with you. I appreciate you being part of this discussion, and um, I'm sure everybody's going to benefit greatly. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks. I uh, hope someone, you know, I hope people can, you know, at least pick up a little bit from it. And uh, thank you so much for having me on, Marty. I appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. Okay, really enjoyed those interviews. Uh, really respect all those guys and their opinion. To recap, some of the points that stand out in my mind are, you know, like how Ty talked about 
you know, rolling like an 80 year old a couple times a week and just having that easygoing attitude. And also to avoid surgery if at all possible and stress how a clean diet is very important. You also stress coming to class even if you're injured so you can quote smell the academy air. And this seems to be a theme with everybody on the show today that it's very important not to start missing class and you know, get caught up in a, a downward spiral. Uh, Roy talked about the two-week period after the injury is very important and it's critical not to re-injure yourself. Again, he talked about going to class during that downtime and, and the phrase watching is learning, but also stressed that you must have the discipline to observe and not get on the mat. Just study other people. And then also to adapt physically when coming back to training, maybe trying some things that you normally wouldn't be part of your game to accommodate that injury especially as it's healing, and also to tap early as part of a preventive strategy and don't get caught up in the ego. He also stressed warming up is critical and to warm up like an old man. He also spoke of uh, anticipating the downtime or depressed feelings after an injury. So the more you kind of know that they will probably arrive at some point, the, the better you are to deal with them instead of being taken by surprise and overcome by them. Peter on stressed the importance of our expectations and keeping those in check and to submit or surrender to the journey itself. So very good stuff there. Ego can be huge when it comes to injuries. So we all need to definitely remember that. Uh, Mark spoke about working around the injury using limitations in your training. And uh, again, if you're inclined to be able to, to do that, you know, get on the mat and, and work around your injuries Again, I think that can really develop a lot of your game if you can discipline yourself and not get too enthusiastic about it. He also stressed the importance of going to class and observing and training methodology being very important of the academy. And if academy has too many injuries going on, then that certainly speaks to the methodology and that needs to be looked at closely and probably changed. He also spoke about uh, if you own your own academy, you know, avoid having the new students roll and don't be discouraged when you have an injury, but look for that silver lining. This can be a time for growth if you'll keep an open mind and just look at it from a different perspective. A lot of people have come back from an injury much stronger and in a lot of ways by adapting this attitude. You know, Doing things differently, looking at things differently, and looking at this as a time to grow. But you have to be willing to embrace that being out of your comfort zone to do this. Henry talked about the need to work for balance in our bodies and being proactive in your recovery, which I think is really, really uh, important. I like how he used the term upgrade the software. And we should keep in mind that we can grow and develop without going hard all the time. So uh, as Hedron likes to say, keeping it playful, keeping it real some of the time and keeping it playful other times can really help us in the long run as we continue our journey and want to do this for the rest of our lives. You know, I'm just finishing up a certification in the breathing class, Dr. Belisa Varanich. Uh, you may have heard her on a previous episode, who's a breathing expert, and got into her work so much that I wanted to, you know, study it on more of an advanced level and get certified in it. So it, uh, it has been an incredible weekend. And I bring this up to say that this can also be very useful when it comes to injuries. The more mobility our rib cage has, the, the more we're going to be able to take a lot of the use and abuse of being on the mat. So it's going to help prevent. But also, if you have an injury, there are certain kind of breathing, and I'll get into this more on our show later on, but there's a, there's a kind of breathing that's a very active, dynamic breathing. So it's much different than the kind of slow, relaxation, kind of esoteric type breath uh, you may have heard of. So this is more of a dynamic. It's actually a breathing workout. So whether you have a knee injury, a neck injury, fingers, whatever it may be, shoulders, you're not using those body parts, but you're doing a very dynamic breath workout and it stimulates your lymphatic flow, your blood flow, increases your heart rate, and you generally break a sweat because it's very vigorous and, and you get a lot of endorphins released. So this can be a workout without taxing that injury, but also with the endorphins, it can kind of ward off some of that potential depression of being out so really cool. I'll get into that more later on. I just want to kind of mention it and give you a preview. 
Okay, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I think it's very important to discuss this. Hopefully we can all benefit from this. And thanks again to my guests, Ty Gay, Roy Dean, Hedron Gracie, Mark Kugro, and Henry Akins. I really appreciate them being part of this conversation. Would love to hear your feedback, so definitely let me know what you thought about it. All right, stay tuned next for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Okay, time for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Today's thought comes from Lynn Lane and his Morning Mojo message. And it starts with a quote. It is my sincere belief that you can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. And that quote is from Zig Ziglar. And my friend Lynn says, A quote of wisdom and a solid principle to live by. When you help others up or through a challenge, you also help yourself. Makes little difference where you are in life. As long as you add some value to someone else, you will add more value to your life. One good deed, one small compliment, or one act of kindness will start the boomerang effect. And you'll reap the value of it in the future. We all have talents, skills, and abilities that we can share with others to help them along the way. Help someone and help yourself today. And I really like that message and I encourage you as you go through your day, your week, your month to keep this in mind. Help as many other people get what they want in life and by doing so you'll elevate yourself and help yourself get what you want. Hey we're all in this together right? So let's support each other and keep each other going in a positive direction. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. I appreciate all feedback, so if you have feedback, please don't hesitate to give it. If you have ideas for the show or for guests, please let me know about those. You can leave feedback on the website at www.gracyjujitsurocks.com. You can also leave feedback on iTunes, and while you're there, make sure to rate the show. It helps us with our standing in iTunes. If you haven't liked us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, please go ahead and do that. And don't forget to share the episodes on your Facebook and social media. Again, thanks again for listening. And until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.